Does anybody know what this is? What cells? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the human body is amazing, right? There are over 100 billion cells in our body, and 30 to 40 billion cells die every day in our body. And the most of them, hopefully, will be recovered and replaced by new one. Other cells in our body will mutate, they will be, get stronger, they will get better. Not always, but sometimes. And if we put all those 30 to 40 billion cells after each other, after one after another, we will get at two kilometers. So I don't want to see that long snake here in this room by all these people, but it's an interesting fact, right? So the human body is really, really interesting, but has nothing to do with what we talk about today. <laughs> and hello, I'm Hannes. <laughs> and today we are talking about Android architecture by example. So what does that mean? I picked some um, open source uh, projects um, available on GitHub and checked the source code of them a little bit out uh, regarding architectural patterns. And today I want to talk about some, let's say, pitfalls I found, some improvements we could apply, but it shouldn't be, uh, I, I don't want to blame anybody of them. They did a great job, just a disclaimer on that part. And yeah, but before we get started, who has been slowed down by bad code? Raise your hands. So why do you write bad code? Just think about it for a second. And if you ever did have detected bad code, you want to touch it, right? You want to change it to make good code. But then you have to feel that if you touch it, you might break it. So how do we ensure that we actually don't break things? Tests. Yeah, right, tests. She will get a gift afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but Unfortunately, the, the session or the time is not long enough to cover tests as well. But I want to talk a little bit on that, but it's not the main, um, uh, the main goal of this session. But I just want to encourage you to write tests. So let's start with the principles. Who, who doesn't know what solid means? Doesn't. <laughs> so it's my, it's, my, it's my bad, my bad. So we don't have time to cover all of them, so let's stick on the most important one for this session, which is single responsibility. Anybody knows what may be wrong with that class? Of course, regarding single responsibility. Speak out. Book should not be printed itself, I think. Yeah, so actually, what is the responsibility of book? The book, in this case, has two responsibilities, right? It prints and it contains pages. So how could we refactor that for something like that? We could say, hey, the book has just pages, contains just pages, and it has a printer. The printer gets the book and prints the book. So now think about your activities. What are your activities doing? What responsibilities they have? I don't want to even start with fragments. Another thing very important for me, functional programming. Who is doing functional programming? Or let's say other, let's, let's redefine my question. Who is doing functional programming light like Kotlin? And who has, oh, well, raise your hands if you do that. And who is doing hardcore functional programming like Hask Haskell and OCaml, uh, Erlang, whatever? Uh, not that many, but you are my hero. <laughs> so functional programming, what is functional programming about? On functional programming, we focus on what and not on how. So what does that mean? Who can tell me what this code does? Oh, I took way too long. Yeah, speak out if you know it. I will repeat it. Also. Yeah, it's classical word count. Yeah, exactly. So this function xxx is a word count. So what it does? What it does? It takes a list or a, 
an array of strings, words as input, iterates over all of them, puts them in a hash map just to count the occurrence of the word with the word as key and the occurrence as value, and so on. So if I would write that as a function in a functional programming language, then it would like, look like this. So the f this is, by the way, Kotlin. Pretty awesome language if you're not using it yet. You should definitely start using it. So the first thing we do, we get the array of strings as input. Then we say group that words by. And then we pass in a lambda expression and say, OK, word is the input of, the of this function. And group that to word. OK, that doesn't seem to make much sense. But what it, what it actually does is it groups by the word, which is the, will then be the key of the resulting map. And we have a list of strings containing always the same word. So basically, if we have A, B, A as input, then we will have a map with A as key and A, A as value in the, in the list of two A's. So then we do a map value, which basically then we say, OK, give the entry and take the, the, the size of the list, which is the second parameter. And in Kotlin, we can also cut that a little bit more down, a little bit more concise. So now, think about that code and the code which you saw before. Which one is more clear to read? Which one is easier to maintain? In which one you can make more mistakes? Which one you can make more boxes, bugs? OK, let's go ahead. Let's say we want to have the most frequent, in a, uh, the most frequent word, which means the word that occurs at most. What we would do in a classic Java way would be something like that, right? So we would start iterating over the whole map that we get back from the previous uh, method uh, count words. Then we will do some check, or we have to, to, to save a pair string and the integer value and check against that, which is called most frequent in that. And we also want to do uh, some kind of threshold. So if the occurrence is not more than five, let's say, then we won't return anything. And otherwise, we will just take the most uh, that has minimum five as value. So with a functional programming language, this would look like this. Basically, we would do we would cover that map to a list just because it's easier for me to work on, but I'm pretty sure that would also be a good way to do that with map. But for me, it was the easiest way to do that. And then we basically say, OK, we have the list. We sort the list. Then we filter the list regarding the threshold, so everything that, is, uh, that occurs not as much as the threshold, we will filter out. And then we say, OK, take the first. And again, the difference here is, we here we are focusing on what what we are doing. We are doing, uh, we are getting the most frequent word, right? And in, on the other hand, in Java, we are focusing on how we implement it. Actually, we see all these for loops, all these if statements. Yeah, do you get it? And then is also another important thing: immutability. So, if you are in a baseball stadium and you are sitting somewhere in the middle of the tribune and you will get hungry, so you will ask the vendor over there um, for a hot dog, but you won't stand up to get over there to get a hot dog. So what you will do is you scream at the vendor, hey, pass me a, a hot dog over. And what the vendor will do, it will give the hot dog to the first ones in your row, sitting on your row, and that one will give it to his neighbor, and that one will give it to his neighbor until you, get, until you have it in your hand. But actually, you don't want that nobody bites a bit of your hot dog, right? So basically, you want an immutable hot dog. <laughs> and that actually means immutability is um, a core principle which we should apply more. Unfortunately, Java as programming language doesn't cover that per se well. But there are ways to do that. And one way is auto value. So auto value is an annotation processor by Google. Uh, but there are also others like Im Immutable. It's also, there's also a library called Immutable. There's also Dex or something like that for um, doing the pretty the same. But Auto Value has a pretty nice feature called extension functions. So in general, how, who, who doesn't know how um, annotation processing works? So I can give a short introduction. Yeah, everybody almost. So basically, 
uh, an annotation processor will generate code out of uh, your annotated class or elements by scanning your class and your annotated elements. So auto value is basically just an annotation processor. You define an abstract class like hotdog, and then there are some extensions since auto value 1.2. For instance, there's a parsable extension. So you basically say implements parsable, include that uh, parsable extension function, uh, extension dependency, sorry, in your Gradle file, and it will automatically generate the parsable stuff all for you, which is really great to do it by hand, right? Then there's more. We can also annotate it with add JSON um, to get, some, for instance, Moshi or JSON running, um, or to, to, to generate code that actually is generated at compiled and not be a reflection at runtime. So we could gain maybe uh, performance improvements there. But there's also another uh, extension like add column name, which is out the value cursor. Basically, we can map a value from database, SQLite database, which returns a cursor automatically into an out the value object. And there are many, many others more, and it's actually pretty easy to write some of them. And Reinhardt has, has been a lot in the latest Android Weekly uh, newsletter and so on, explaining some stuff. So you definitely should check that out if you're interested in this area. But actually, how do... So this class is an abstract class, so who is actually implementing that? And that is the autovalue underscore hotdog class. So autovalue underscore, underscore hotdog class has package visibility, so it's only visible to this package. And that makes the whole thing immutable, because you are always programming against hotdog. Yeah, do you get it? And there's also some more things like builders and so on, and some copy things for immutability out of, uh, already provided by out of value. Okay, so now we have these three or four key concepts, immutability, functional programming, uh, solid or at least single responsibility. Let's dive into some examples. So, model view controller. What is actually model view controller? So, Rainskalk has invented that design pattern in, I guess, in which year? I mean, he's, this photo is from, I think, 2012. Yeah. In the 70s, yeah. 1979. Actually, he was a small talk programmer, and he invented that. And his idea of this pattern was, okay, there's a model, the view observes that model, and displays that, and there's a controller. But a controller was not li something like an activity, which is kind of super controller and doing everything. Actually, a controller is just something like an on-click listener. So the controller on a checkbox, for instance, um, will manipulate the underlying model, which was, for instance, a Boolean field. The view will be observed, uh, will be notified via the observer pattern and displays it. And basically, here we also have not only one controller, but each of them UI widget has its own controller. So now think about activities, fragment on iOS. There are view controllers in the back end. There are controllers for routing and so on. So the word controller is not actually the meaning of the original uh, thing today. But what I would like to get there is to that old definition by the original definition of model view controller, because it's definitely more concise. OK, so let's start with some simple projects. There is uh, uh, OmniNotes, which is basically uh, uh, application to, to write some notes down. It has 506 stars on GitHub. It's still uh, under heavy development, and it has a 4.4 rating on the Play Store and over 100,000 installs on the Play Store. The app looks like this. So basically, you can have a list of um, uh, notes. You can. F the second screen shows how you can f sort the list of notes by such a drop-down menu, and the third screenshot shows how to create a, such a node. Okay, so how is this built? Ma mainly by fragments and activities, and it uses some async tasks with a weak reference as callback, mainly to not leak memory, I guess. But 
it also uses event bus for some strange reasons. And we will talk about the event bus later. And basically, it, it writes some things down like in a database and a file storage. So the key point here is they have quite huge fragment and activities doing everything. And remember to the single responsibility thing, they have some things like holding a list of elements which were um, highlighted right now. There's no clear separation of model and view because the own controller, if we want to activity, uh, name it as controller, the controller holds some kind of his own model and the real model and other stuff and view stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that's a typical kind of um, application we see quite often when we get started in Android. So we do have a lot of huge code in the fragment. And the first design pattern I would talk about is Redux. So Redux is basically a JavaScript um, invention. Um, and the, the slogan of that is predictable state container. So everybody, uh, who has heard of Redux before? Please raise your hand. Yeah, not that many. So let's see how this works. Basically in Redux, we have three components, a store, and the store is basically a state container of the model. That's it it holds a model in a store. And the model is immutable. And we will see later what that means. An action is a command to change that model. So basically we say, hey, store, here is a reducer function. And the reducer function gets an action and the old state of the model. So let's see how this is in, oh yeah. Before we start to see how it is in action, it's worthwhile to mention that this reducer function is a pure function. And what is a pure function? Again, this is something related to functional programming a little bit more than to traditional imperative programming. But a pure function basically doesn't have side effects. And what are side effects? Who can spot here a side effect in this code? Please speak out. Yeah, exactly. Result will be set every time we call add. What's the problem with side effects? Well, we can't really be sure whenever we pass the same value as argument in that we get the same value as argument out because it depends on the result variable, right? So it's hard to debug, it's easy to make bugs, and it's hard to test. And the root of all evil is the assignment statement. Said Robert C. Martin's better known as Uncle Bob. And this is the same function as a pure function. So it takes in x and epsilon and returns the sum of them. So it's easy. But the point is, here you have no side effect. And that's the key principle of, fun of functional programming in combination with focus on the how and not on the what and immutability. So let's get back to Redux. So again, Redux state, action, and a reducer. So the reducer, again, is a pure function. It gets the state, the old state, and an action, and then it returns the new state. That's the idea of the Redux. So let's see how this could be. So if you take that application, uh, we might have an Omni-model. And the Omni-model, here's the, here's the first big difference to what you would call a model. This Omni-model is the whole application. So there is exactly one model representing the whole application. OK? So in this case, it contains a list of nodes. And then there is an action, like an add node action, where we pass in, which is a, a class, where we have also a title and a description and so on. And then there's a re reduce function. And the reduce function looks like this. So there is an action as input, and the old model as input parameter as well. And what we do is, if the action is the instance of add node, because in Java we have type safety in JavaScript, this is a little bit easy, and usually they do some string comparison stuff. And if it is, then we basically say, OK, from the, we copy the old model. Again, model, uh, the Omni model is immutable, so we can't, there's no setter. We can't change the state easily. But there is, auto value provides a with uh, method, so we can copy the old value with the new value, until the plus is just because I run out of space, it should mean copy a new list containing the old list and adding the new one item into the list. So what we get out is the new um, 
So it is a typo. It's not new nodes, but it's new Omni model. New model. Okay? So we put that in the store. We take the Omni model, we take the reducer function, and we put it in the store. And the store is some kind of singleton. So it's application wide containing, again, the model, which is the whole application. And we will see later what I mean with whole application and the reducer function. And then the view subscribes to the store. In other words, it observes the store. And it will get notified when the model will be changed and display that part of the model. Okay? So, for instance, if we. If we um, act, and there's also the dispatch function to hand in our action. So, the, the view to create a new um, node will hand in this action. It runs through the reducer, creates a new store's output, and then will notify the view, in this instance the other view, and this will display the new state. The same would be true for instance to filter, um, uh, no, to order the, the list of elements, the list of nodes. So in this case we have a drop-down menu and then this drop-down menu, we now select last modified date as filter. Okay? So what we do is, again, we pass in an action into that store. And now you will note that the Omni model has also an order by flag, which I have skipped before, but it was always there. And that's what I mean with only one model for the whole application. So basically, every view state is in one giant model. And there are views and smaller views, like this drop-down uh, list containing the filters, also a view, and it will also get notified with the new one which is now selected. So not clicking on the item will select that last modified in that radio buttons uh, thing, but actually the, dis the dispatcher at uh, the store which will notify this view, and it will also notify the whole list of elements on the left. Okay? So basically this is kind of model view controller, kind of, not really, but more to that traditional Renskauk model view controller definition instead of what we call controller nowadays, okay? So again, what's the deal of Redux? We get immutability, we get the unidirectional data flow because we can't change any model in our activity directly. We may have to pass in an action and then it will return out a new state and they have pure function. So the next application is Telegram. Telegram, um, maybe some of you know, is some kind of WhatsApp uh, alternative with uh, security in mind, and have 4,999 stars. Sorry about that. But no, it's a great app. And it also has 4.5 rating and quite a huge installs. It looks like this. And the architecture of that app is basically they don't have big fragments and activities, but they in general they have big classes. So the most of these classes are over a thousand lines of code, and uh, a few more are very, very big ones. And what they have, they have a message controller. And this message controller is not a controller at all. It's basically just some kind of manager or call it repository or whatever. It, it connects to the database. It has some in memory cache, so it, do, it does a lot of stuff, but it's called controller for some strange reason. So it's not a RINSCAL controller, it's not an activity or we, what we call controller, it's a message controller or a context controller. And basically, it's a singleton and it will be used from very, very uh, um, many places, like from an adapter, from an activity, and so on. So let's see how we could improve that with Flux. Who has heard of Flux before? A little bit more than Redux. Um, Flux, from, his, from a historical point of view, was there before Redux, so maybe that's the reason why it's a little bit more popular. And by the way, Flux and Redux is, uh, as I already said before, by the, um, popular in the JavaScript world, and it's also used quite commonly with React Native. And what Flux basically is, is something like that. So it's similar to Redux at first glance, but not really, as we will see. So what we have here is the view. The view triggers an action. That's basically the same as in Redux. So we give an action to the dispatcher. The dispatcher then is responsible to dispatch that action to a store. So there's not only one single model 
there are now multiple stores. And the store is basically something like uh, um, what they called before um, a message controller or contacts controller. So the, a store is basically kind of repository pattern, if we want to say it like that. So it accesses the database, it gets some data out, and then it notifies the view. The view is observing the store and say, hey, here's the new data. So again, we have this unidirectional data flow. So let's see how this would work. So when the app starts, for instance, on the left, we see the list of um, um, conversations. Then it triggers a show list action. The show list action then will come over to the view. Ah, by the way, I should mention, uh, the view uh, is a little bit tricky here because they call it view, but actually it's some kind of contr view controller because in, in JavaScript they have this um, virtual dome thing, so they have a controller which is actually some kind of click listen or some kind of activity we could say. And then they have the real view which is the UI widget which will get updated. So here view means view controller, okay? So the action will get triggered by the view, will go to the dispatcher, the dispatcher then says, okay, this should go to the message store because we want to get messages out of it. But there could also be a contact store, there could be multiple store, stores, and actually one action could also affect multiple stores or query multiple stores. And that's also the responsibility of the dispatcher to check um, the kind of dependency. So should I query first the message and then the contacts and so on. So here we also have not a clear separation of of uh, responsibilities because the dispatcher is not only dispatching, it's also coordinating some stuff and dependency management, okay? And then we get a new um, model instance out and we'll notify the view, which, which is actually the view controller, sorry for that, but it's important for the next slide to mention that. And the view will then display it. And the same would be uh, done if we get some kind of push notification. So action doesn't have to be triggered by uh, by the UI. It could also be an incoming push notification which triggers an action and the flow goes the same way. So what is the good thing about Flux? So the store only has uh, getters, so you can't really set things on the model. But the model per se is not immutable uh, according to the definition, but usually it is. But in the JavaScript it's world, it's not, there are not really immutable objects. Um, or we well, okay, in, in ES6 there are, but okay, yeah. But the good thing here is the unidirectional data flow again. So we have always this circle kind of, right? But what's actually, if you think about Flux, what's actually the difference to MVC? Oh, sorry. So the store is basically a model because the store gets observed by the view. And the view is all kind of controller because it's already said it handles some click uh, listener or some checkboxes and then does uh, or triggers an action. So basically it's just MVC from my point of view. But with an unidirectional data flow, which is a great thing. Twitter Re is a Twitter client. It, ha it has 873 stars on GitHub and also rating 4.1 and quite a lot installs too. It looks like that. It has some pretty nice material design. And how is it implemented under the hood? So they don't use async tasks, but they have some kind of own abstract task base class, which is kind of their own async task implementation. And it uses some weak reference and an event bus and a content resolver. And it's all in this async task. And what it does is, when it gets a result, this async task, or this abstract task, is, is it called, will run. If the weak reference is still there, it will be notified there. If it's not there, it will be trigger some action over the event bus. So basically, it's, I've, at least from my understanding, it is some kind of prevention to leak memory when the user um, do, uh, do a, does a screen orientation change. And then it also writes some things in the content, in the content uh, reserver and resolver, and there's also an observer. So it's a little bit weird regarding the yeah, stuff, how things will be, will be notified to the view. But 
actually their fragments and activities are pretty small, so they have that separation. They have view controller activities with less code, but the async task has a lot of code in, in there and doing yeah, not always so clear workflows. So they don't have really that unidirectional workflow as we have discussed before by Flux and Redux. And this is the only one with which uses Dagger. And actually Dagger 2 dependency injection is also quite important, but it's out of the scope of this topic, uh, this talk. Who knows what this is? Speak out. Yeah, cache coherence protocol. So where is that used? In CPUs, in multi-core CPUs. And the interesting thing about that is that the CPU cores have to share their states about memory, lo um, memory variables which are in memory state in the CPU, which are cached. It's a little bit, yeah, it's not the best description, but it's, a it's, it's not an easy topic, at least for me. But the interesting thing here is each core has to communicate with the other core. And they are actually doing that by using an event bus. Okay? But why are they using an event bus? They are using an event bus because it's easier to implement, because they assume that only one sender can use the event bus at the same time. Otherwise, it would be very hard to implement that um, cache coherence protocol. Does anybody know what that is? That's a tricky one. Yeah, kind of. It's a CAN bus used in the cars. And why are they using that in the car? They're using in the car because otherwise it would be very expensive to connect each component with each other. So this is also an event bus, and they can be uh, two kilometer long. So in your car, you may have two kilometers of this scan cable. And but they have good reasons to use an event bus system. And what is your reason to use an event bus? Is it easier to implement an algorithm? Is it because of cost? Ah. Just think about that, okay? So, the f see, the thing with event bus is a lot of people use it to dispatch async work back to the UI, and that's fine, but event bus can get out of hand quickly. For instance, I've worked on a team where we did that, and it was fine, it worked, but then somehow we get to too used to that pattern. Then somehow we saw the event bus in our custom view group and doing something like that. Not done by me, by someone else. Not that I'm perfect, but it also happened to me one time in an adapter, and then the adapter calls notify things, and that also calls then uh, triggers an event bus, and then we had some event loops going on, and it, it get quickly out of hand if not used correctly. So that's the thing with event bus. But the thing about with event bus is most developers don't know about the observer pattern anymore because they have the event bus and the first thing that come in their mind is event bus, I can send an event and that's it. But if you think back at school days or when you started programming, the first thing you have learned was the observer pattern, right? Okay, so how could we improve this Twitter rewrap? So I will step over that model view view model thing uh, a little bit quickly because there are already a lot of resources out there. Um, view model is some kind of man in the middle. It uses a data binding engine to update the view automatically. So you don't have to write code for that usually. And the view model observes the view, uh, the, the, the model, sorry. Okay, so far so good, nothing new here. So with the data binding engine given us by Google, this would look like that. We would have some observable string message, some observable int uh, stars. And those classes are provided us by the data mining engine. Is that is everybody familiar with that? Or okay, good. So what's the problem here? The problem is immutability, because the observable string reference object is bound to the data binding engine. 
and that means that we can't change it anymore. Uh, we can change it, and that's a restriction regarding our immutability. We also do some kind of ex coding some business logic in XML, which is not that big an issue if you do it not for everything, but it's not testable if you do it in XML. And one thing that most of these uh, model view, view model things lack at all is some kind of what to do with an error state, what to do with a loading indicator. And even on the Windows phone, we have some nice things like, okay, we, do, we, uh, we um, have data binding for our list of elements, but we manually set the view indicator to visible or gone or something like that. So why not doing b everything, right? And that's now the part where reactive programming comes in. Who knows what this class is? Yeah. So I, n I have to admit that I never have really used it in my old Java days because I always or almost always have written it by my own. But basically, that's the observer pattern. And who use um, Eric's Java here? Please raise your hand. Oh, quite a lot. That's great. But why are you using Eric's Java? It's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome, yeah. <laughs> Other reasons. <laughs> Convenient APIs. For what? Solving everyday problems, I think. <laughs> yeah, but if we go back and say, okay, that's convenient, convenient API is basically just the same that Kotlin offers us, right? So we have mat, flat map. That's, that's, that's something functional programming offers us. So we don't have necessarily used to Eric's Java for that. So other reasons why we all use Eric's Java? Easy threading. Easy threading. Yeah, but why wouldn't it then the, the main class be called threadable and not observable? It's cool. It's cool. Yeah. See, the f the key thing I want to to tell you is that the key con the key core principle of this um, X Java or reactive programming thing is the observer pattern. Basically, exactly that class. You are every operator is basically in a okay saying it in a very low high level naive way observing the previous output. Right? And that's the reason why we can do some threading stuff and that like uh, in a very convenient way. But principle, in principle, this is the observer pattern. Okay? And I want to show you a, a short video of Andres Stoltz, which is the author of Eric's Java, um, Eric's, uh, sorry, Cycle.js, which uses Eric's JS, which is JavaScript uh, pandan of Eric's, ja Eric's Java. Now, I showed you some code that you probably didn't even understand. And a lot of people get scared of observable, and that's totally OK, because actually RxJS is quite hard to reason about. I mean, everyone says that React makes it easy to reason about your code, but Cycle does the opposite. So why would I do that? Why would I make you like, have to learn this weird stuff, right? So let me tell you a story, OK? Let's try to sell this. Just, let's just pretend that we are all in the 19th century here right now, okay? Um, all of us here use horses as a means of transportation. So if you're going to go back home or to the hotel today, you're going to take a horse. So horses are pretty easy to reason about, right? You just get on top of them, you sort of press the sides, and you say, like, go, okay? Go. And yeah, so, but let's suppose that for some reason, someone from the 21st century takes a time machine, goes back to the past, and they meet you. And they say, hi, pleasure to meet you. I am from the future. Hey, I want to show you something. And then they show you this. <laughs> and your first reaction is, uh, will not be like, yeah, yeah, that's a car, shut up. Uh, your first reaction will be like, whoa, that's, that's pretty cool. But also like, whoa, that's kind of scary, right? Maybe it's dangerous. Um, and also like, whoa, how the hell do you use this thing? Well, it all starts with the ignition. You need to have a key, and then you have the clutch and the gears. But uh, you need to keep your hands on the uh, steering wheel, but don't forget to start by releasing the handbrake and gradually release the clutch while you're giving gas. Oh, by the way, Americans don't know this concept because they have uh, automatic cars. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, like, you know, in Brazil and in Europe, people have this stuff. So what is like, this is quite hard to reason about, you know? Um, yeah, so by the way, you also need to learn hundreds of, 
traffic signs and driving conventions. And it's not like, you know, you sit on the chair for half an hour and you learn it. You know, people take serious trainings and exams and not everyone passes. Like, maybe you didn't pass, right? Maybe you didn't pass on this stuff. And parallel parking. Wow, such learning curve. Much steep. So without any training, you decide to give this car stuff some a test drive. So you get inside the car, you put your hands on the wheel, and you kick the sides of the seat as if it would be a horse. And nothing happens. And then you say, like, well, maybe, yeehaw! And just nothing happens. So what, what do you do next? You go to Stack Overflow, and you put a question there saying, like, I got inside the car, and I put my hands on the wheel, and I kicked the sides, and nothing happens. How do you make this work? It does not work. And then, you know, in these moments, I just go like, oh my God, oh my God. So then you get frustrated and you quit all this car nonsense. And you proudly say, you know, I actually love horses. You know, they're like friendly animals. You know, it's not like these machines. And you can ride horses on any terrain, be the grass or rivers with stone or dirt and stuff. It's not like these stupid cars that only go on asphalt fields built specifically for cars. So, okay, you're a proud horse rider. That's, that's perfectly okay if you want to do that. And you can actually accomplish quite a lot with just using horses, you know? Like Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire, they conquered a whole continent. It was actually the biggest empire with just using horses and bows and arrows. So, you can do a lot with just horses. But cars are better. So I have to thank uh, Andre Staltz, which is that smart guy over here, who has allowed me to show you this video. Because honestly, I couldn't explain it better. So who hasn't got in touch yet with Alex Java? Yeehaw! <laughs> okay, so there's that quite cool thing. What's that? So we said, okay, we have the bus, we have Eric's Java, okay, let's make an RX bus. No, don't do that. That, that, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> why would you do that? Either use an event bus or use Eric's Java. Eric's Java is just observer compatible, we said. So why not observe that thing directly via Eric's Java, right? Okay, so then we have something like model view, new model controller. Great. What is it? So the controller is basically, oh and by the way, now we are using Alex Java and not the data binding engine anymore. So this Twitter, Twitter re app could be something like that. We could have a feed controller. And what is the feed controller? The feed controller is basically responsible to load some feed, some tweets. And why would you put them in a controller? Because otherwise we have hard coded them into the home feed view model and then it wouldn't be reusable anymore because it's in the home feed model, right? So the smart guys over at, well, Windows Phone decided that this could be a chance to improve that pattern at all. So how does it work? Okay, so there are comments. Another thing that view models in the Android worlds are missing quite often. Um, by the way, that's something I don't really understand, that we Android developers tend to reinvent the wheel over and over again, even there were already definitions for that pattern, which most of the time were already better, as that what we are reinventing. So this command thing is basically an observable, and the home feed is the view. And what the home feed does is it subscribes itself to the load command provided by the view model. Okay? But it not only this, what does actually it mean, subscribes itself? It not subscribes itself, but it's, for instance, it subscribes his adapter, or it subscribes a text directly by using some, there are some Eric's, Eric's UI patterns out there lately released by some smart guy here in the audience, talk to him later. And there's Jake Wharton with his uh, amazing libraries, and one of them is also providing observables and actions um, for Eric's JS uh, for Eric's Java stuff. So basically, we can we have this data binding. We don't have to do it manually, right? And the last thing I want to talk about, or oh no, it's the not the last, but it's the Plaid app. Who ha knows what this app is? Yeah, quite some people. It's very popular on GitHub. 
although it still is in, is in beta version, it's not available in the Play Store, but has some downloads, mainly from developers, because it's a pretty awesome app with a really great UI programmed by Nick Batcher, uh, Android developer advocate. And the problem here is that it doesn't have clear separation of responsibilities. It, it was built f to, to be understandable by everyone. So it doesn't use Eric's Java. It doesn't use event bus, regardless if it's a good idea or not. But it uses all those simple, compon simple Android components. Also, it uses Android services, something we often forget about. But they are there for some reasons. Okay? And one thing that is also quite common is to use shared preference to persist everything. So basically what the Blad app does, which I haven't said before, is um, in this picture on the left, uh, on the right, sorry, um, you see some image, images or some items um, loaded from some various data sources like um, Dribbly, from some designer data sources, uh, and so on. So you can choose some topics where you um, want to show some items. Okay. And the hard stuff here is that you can actually um, bring a drawer out. And in this drawer, you can press some buttons to disable some sources or to add some sources and so on. And it should react on that thing and up update this list of items. Okay. So far, we have talked about the model view, view model thing. And we're going to now to talk about model view presenter. And we also have talked about model view controller. But one very important thing is that those are not architectures. Those are just some design patterns to separate your UI from your model. Okay? And that's where the clean architecture comes in. The clean architecture was defined by Uncle Bob again, which is a really, really smart man. And what he says it is, OK, there should be, let's, oh, that's also a good thing. Let's, how would you build your app? Who is doing Scrum here? Yeah, some people. Okay, and how do you start usually in Scrum? What what is the first thing you do? You will. Yeah, okay, <laughs> Flint. Um, but from my experience, the first thing you will do is you will ship up products to your customer because you want to iterate fast. You get fast some feedback. And what this actually means is, you will always concentrating on the view part. Right? You don't start at the model or at, the, at your architecture. You start with the view because you do also some prototyping, but it really depends from company to company. I agree, but okay. But here is the thing: the thing is, you should have a clear separation of concern, and you mainly achieve that if you start from bottom up and not from top down. Top means view, bottom model, or business logic. And the clean architecture basically says, okay, here is on the right, on the left, there are entities. And entities are plain Java models, plain Java objects. They are just containing some data. And then there's an interactor or some use cases or call it repository pattern or whatever. Basically, the interactor grabs some models and pass it to the presenter. And the presenter is going to transform that in a presentation model to display it in the view. So the view should be very dumb. It should only display that thing that he gets, and that's it that he gets from presenter. But the important thing here is the separation of concerns and these boundaries, which are these dotted lines. So the presenter is not depending on the interactor. There is an interface or a boundary between them so that can be changed, mocked, whatever. And the same is true between view and presenter, or at least in my definition. That's not what Uncle Bob said, but I have added it. OK? The clean architecture is not uh, it's quite common, so I guess we I don't have to explain it more detailed. But here's the thing. There's another smart guy, Jesse Wilson, working at Square, and he said, break the rules. And that's a blog post, really worthwhile reading. And what he basically says is not about programming, it's about everything in life. He says, if you don't know what you're doing, and for instance, he says, I'm not a designer, I'm a developer, then I'm following guidelines. For instance, I follow the material guidelines by Google because I'm not knowing how to make it better by my own. 
But once I am an experienced programmer, I know about the clean architecture, I know about use cases, I know about the things. But all the things should be all in my head and shouldn't be um, a rule to follow strictly and blindly. So break the rules, keep that separation of constants and the boundary in mind, but you don't necessarily have to follow that um, clean architecture, even if it's a great thing. So if you are a new developer, follow that. But if you are an experienced and you know what you're doing, then some things might can be over-engineered following the clean architecture. Basically, clean architecture can, could, is, could be split in 100 layers if you want to, but maybe your app only needs one layer. So just go with the simple way, build just one layer. Okay? So that's basically what Jesse Wilson is saying in his blog post. And he ha has a really great talent to write down such blog posts in, I don't know, 100 words, and that's it. And it was, wow. Well, when I'm writing, I'm writing, uh, I don't know, 10,000 words, and it doesn't make sense at all. So. Okay. And so how we could improve that plat architecture? Basically, we could we apply its model view presenter. So we have the view, which is the home activity, which shows this list, and we have that filter on the right side. We, we will see soon what that means. And the presenter basically subscribes to the business logic. And the business logic, ignore the, the, left, the thing on the left, it's basically just loading items from different sources, which, which sounds simpler than it actually is. It is quite complex. So let's start the app. So what we now here do is applying some kind of reactive MVP. You click on that, okay? So an event gets triggered by your view, by the fragment. Then this will pass to the presenter. The presenter will then write it in a database. Here we use SQL Bright DAO. And then this database will update the presenter and the presenter the view. And the same will be done by this items loader. This items loader basically says, okay, now I get a new list of, it of sources which are open, uh, which are enabled, and now I load those items automatically. And then the presenter updates the view, and you will see in the background that this will be done. And the thing here is, we have an unidirectional data flow. We don't have an event bus. There is no kind of communication between presenter and the other presenter. That's not needed. We are going back to the observer pattern by using Eric's Java, but we are just observing the model by the presenter. And every presenter does that and automatically updates itself in an unidirectional way. And by the way, we also use here um, auto value, so we have immutability as well. The view basically can't disable a source by itself because it has absolutely no knowledge about that. And there's no public setter to do that. So, again, it goes the way down. It will then update, so the, the source filter fragment doesn't update itself after having clicked or enabled the source. It will get the new result, the new model, something we had before by Flux or Redux, from the model layer da upwards. Yeah. And then we update the UI. And that's basically how we can compose views. We don't have one giant view, one giant activity with one XML format, having one controller or one presenter. No, we can split all those kind of things down into smaller views, smaller presenters, observing the same model, and so they interact. So there's no view-to-view -view interaction. There's no need to do something like a, a fragment um, is listen, has, gets the listener, which is the activity in on fragment attached or something like that. That's not needed. They don't have to communicate in any way. They all communicate the same unidirectional data flow way down. Okay? Great. And the last thing is model view intent, which is inspired by Cycle.js by the smart guy Andre Stultz we saw before with uh, Eric's.js. And that's a little bit a uh, new one, I would say. And basically it says, okay, now we use Eric's Java heavily because we could think of the human being an input by watching something. Then as output, as reaction, I click on a button. So basically this is a pure function. Your brain is a pure function. You have an input and you get an output, which is press that button. Okay? And then the computer has an input, which is a UI event, for instance changes this model and generates an output 
So again, a pure function. Input is a UI event. Output is a new thing visible on the screen or a state change or something like that. Okay? So basically, it's something like that. We have an intent function. The intent function says what to do with the model. And the model is, this is not the model class, it's a model function. The model function gets as parameter an intent, similar to action in Redux before. Some, you can think about that for now, so in that way. And then the model will update the view, or in other words, the view knows how to render the model on, the, on your screen. Okay? And it's like that. So you have an intent that changes the model. The new model will be displayed by the view or rendered by the view. And the view triggers a new intent by, clicking, by, by letting the user click in on something. So here we have, again, this unidirectional data flow. Even better, we have a circle now, okay? A complete circle. And with Alex Java, we can do something like that. Or at least this is my inter interpretation or my implementation. But as I said, it's quite new. There might be better ideas. It's not a port from JS, uh, from CycleJS, but I tried to put all those things together, all the best things that what we had before together in this circle. And what I typically do is use model view presenter. So I define a search view which is similar to the um, view from MVP. So we define an interface. The interface has a search intent, which is an observable string. So imagine we have our search box and we want to display some results. So we enter some text and then we get some list from backhand or from whatever. And we get some items to display. And the search result is basically something like that. It contains a result uh, with the items and a Boolean flag for loading and for error. So this is our model. And this model is going to be displayed by the search view. And the search engine um, has a function search, which gets which is our model function. Okay, I know this is a little bit confusing. We have a model function and a model. The model function is the search function in the search engine. The model class itself is search result. So what we do is the search result gets an observable in, does something, and returns an observable of search result out. Okay? So basically think of typing in a text, and each text input will trigger a new intent get down to the search engine, and the search engine will return then a uh, result. That's the circle. Okay? I know it's a little bit complicated. But, and then we put that all together. And the presenter, the presenter has an attach view uh, thing, and it gets the view as input. And basically, when the view is created, and sets up that circle. So what it does is says model uh, view, which is search uh, which is search view, uh, does the intent and subscribe on the show result method provided by the view. Okay, it's a little bit tricky, but what it does now, there's the circle which automatically updates. So what we have here is, we have a presenter, so we could also plug in a presentation model here, which is quite useful. A presentation model is, as I said before, just a model optimized for the view, so that the view basically just say, get a model saying, okay, show that flag in that color. So the view doesn't have to compute anything. There's no algorithm in the, in the view anymore on complex logic. Okay? So we have the best from MVP, which is uh, the presentation model thing, even if it's missing in this example here. Um, then we have the automatically data binding thing. So the search, the view is automatically updated because of this subscribe, file, double point, double point, result, show result thing provided by the view. And the intent is triggered automatically by typing uh, in the inbox. So we have done nothing, written three lines of code, and it works, automatically updates itself. Again, with this unidirectional data flow, previously introduced by Flux and Redux. And we also have immutability, because Java, uh, Alex Java, yeah, allows us to do some immutable things, not as shown before with the data binding engine when we have not immutability. Yeah? Uh, I don't understand, or uh, there is a mistake in your interface. Show results, uh, show result in the interface uh, yeah. as an input uh, receives search, search result, or not? Um, show result should be some action one in Alex 
JS. So I guess the the Java Java 8 annotation I tried here to apply is not correct, yeah. But it should be uh, providing an action one, which could be, um, well, you know, the, the Rx Java observable takes one parameter in the subscribe method, which could be an action one uh, thing, which would be the return value of the show result method for the view. I know it's a little bit confusing, and I will show you the slides, and you may have to write to read over it. And it's exactly what Understart said before. The first thing, it doesn't work. But if you look at it, and I'm, oh my God, I have looked at it so many times to get started with CycleJS, which is basically the same pattern, and I didn't understand it. I didn't understand Eric's Java at all the first time. But once you have it, there's so many code you can write more easily and without writing that much code, volubly code. Okay, so there's also not a nice notice. So all of these apps we have shown here are, n are quite good. There are a lot of installs, they have a good reviews. So these two guys, which are known in the Android development community, says, um, well, actually it was uh, Yijit, which is, the, which is working at Google, said that Nobody cares about your architecture. All the user wants is a good UI, and he's right. I mean, the user don't care about your architecture. And even Roman Guy um, agrees on that. And they are right. But uh, they are not... But it's really hard to say it's completely useless to do architecture. But so why we do architecture? Why we do that kind of things? Because we want to go fast. Okay, and we only can go fast if we do some architecture. So this is one of the apps I have worked on, and it's a little bit hard to see. But what? But the key thing I want to show here is that it displays. Um, wait, where's the mouse? Oh, there's no mouse. It doesn't matter. So the 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 left. The right picture displays the home feed, which displays some soccer match, because it's a sports magazine app, D displays some results, and if I click on a match, I get into the detail screen of this match, football match. And the user, the user experience, the user expects, is that both results are the same. So that seems easy, right? But actually, those two data feeds coming from the backend have different caching times. So how do we ensure that both screens are displaying the same result? And another thing, there could be a push notification coming in before the feed, the caching time of the feed runs out. So how do we ensure that thing, that all are displaying the same thing? And there's even more. There's a feature we have. We have some kind of tip guessing um, functionality in our game. So we can scroll the list up and down, as I will show now, and press the tip button, and then we can guess some tips and get some points for that and so on. And here we clearly don't want to inter interrupt the user experience by popping up a dialogue or something like that. So you scroll the list, you do the tipping thing. It's not the main feature, but it's there. So how would you implement that? Speak out. What, what is your first impression of doing that? How would you do that? Well, I can give you a hint. This is just a recycle view item animation uh, doing that flip thing. But how would you actually do that? <laughs> Event bus, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> so the first thing we wanted to do is, OK, we get in the adapter, and we put there a lot of code to, to manipulate the items in the, in the list from the adapter, and then call notify item changed. But we have built this app recording ag according this reactive MVP stuff. So we want to have this unidirectional data flow. And actually, we have immutability, so we weren't able to do that. Otherwise, I'm sure I did that. And that would be a disaster, because it Imagine how complex the adapter was uh, we're going to. And they are not only at this screen, so there are many screens where you can do that kind of stuff and tipping and switching some cells and so on. So what we did is we have that reactive MVP stuff. And here it really matters. What it does is it is basically an ob observable combined latest. So we have four or five input sources. And whenever I test, I press the, or the first observable is the list with news item. The second observable is a uh, function that combines all data feeds together to display the latest result, so that all views are displaying the same result. And the last thing is we have some tip cache thing, which is that thing which displaying the tips that you are uh, guessing. 
And whenever you press the tip button, we don't do anything in the adapter because we can't, because we have immutability to our luck. Otherwise, we, I'm pretty sure we have messed up the whole thing. And we have to go this unidirectional data flow, go into that tip cache, set there a flag to, sh to say, OK, this, tip, th this game should be presented now in tip mode. Then uh, uh, Eric's Java will update the whole thing up to the presenter. The presenter will update the list, and voila, we have it. And what we also do is we have a presentation model. The presentation model um, computes some kind of difference between the previous list and the now going to display list. And basically, it says, OK, this item at position 0, this item at position 1 should now flip. And this is put it into this presentation model, and this presentation model is given to the view, and all the view does, ah, I have to flip it. Ah, so I have to say, notify items uh, changed at position, and then the item animator kicks in and does all the stuff automatically, for, magically for us. So, okay, software architecture matters, but not always. And one thing that matters more is that you should understand why you do some things. You should understand why you use object-oriented programming. Why, why are you doing object-oriented programming? Speak out. Because you learned it in school? Why are you doing Eric's Java? Because it's awesome? So, see, the thing about software architecture is you should know why you are doing things, right? And if you are going to build things, it doesn't matter if you do model view presenter, model view view model, Redux, or whatever, but you should build a Lego house. A Lego house with small components you can replace. You can replace in the same way as your human body replaces your cells every day, because you want to go fast, and your body wants to go fast as well. Otherwise, you won't die if they wouldn't replace your cells. And that's the thing about software architecture. It doesn't matter what you do, but know why you're doing it, and do it in that way that you can have small little cells you can replace. And one last thing, one last quote, I don't even know who said that, but if you like the code you have written a year ago, then you haven't learned enough this year. Because it's true for programming and also for software architecture, it's an evolution, it doesn't stop. That's also the reason why Google won't ever say, OK, now we should do model view view model thing, because it's the best pattern for now and for always. You don't will ever hear that. Actually, it means stagnation, so don't do that. Think outside of the box, look at JavaScript things, look at Windows Phone, what are they are doing, what is a controller, look back in history, learn from failures, and so on. OK, that's all the references. And thank you. Questions? Thank you very much. Would you like to drink some water before you take the questions? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Not to make you shut up, it's just... Okay, guys, questions. If you have a question in Russian and you need translation, we have a couple of nice gentlemen to help you translate. The first question from the lady. Okay, and St. Petersburg, if you have questions, Please have the person to ask the question in the right chair, okay? Hi. Hi. My name is Arana. Uh, Hi. What database do you use in your projects, and have you heard about the Realm? Oh, that's a good what question. What do you think about it? <laughs> because as so, I... Oh. Yeah, no, sorry, continue, continue. I want to hear your it, opinion. Um, handles immutability really... It doesn't handle immutability. <laughs> Yeah. So again, that's the thing. Why, why you want to use Realm or why you want to use SQL? So who is using SQL Lite? Who is using Realm or ROM? Why? So it really depends on the use case. As you said, if I would compare them to, okay, let's say uh, which one is faster and so on, I don't, I don't think that this really matters in a usual app with thousand or ten thousand items stored in a database. Actually, they are pretty in the same. They all both use B trees. No, actually, Realm uses a B plus tree. So there's not really a difference regarding the, the underlying data structure. But the core difference is that the, the one is a data store which keeps things in memory, and the other one is not. And all those. And another very important thing is, as you said, there's no immutability. So for me, it's also a 
I'm fat minus because I want immutability in my thing. I know there's copy from realm things to get some kind of immutable object. Okay, that's one thing. The next thing is, um, in this benchmark, realm is faster. But it, why is it faster? Because it, the benchmark are done against some ORM, some object rela uh, relation manage, uh, mappers. And actually, what realm does is it associates only a byte array for you, and then it, the, the benchmark is finished. Whereas the um, or ORM also does a mapping into a Java object. So basically, Realm is lazy. It's not faster, it's lazy, at least at the first loading time. Because now you are in a recycle, you just scroll, and then somehow the byte array has to be converted to a string. Yeah? And then you are converting that string on your main UI thread. It may not be a big deal, but for some uh, adapters, it may be. So that's also a, a minus one. But the thing very, very important for me is that it is um, pretty good uh, compatible with uh, Rx Java. So the cool thing about SQL Write was, as we saw in the plat thing, that the database itself, whenever I insert a new row, will rerun all the queries which are observing right now. So that's not only uh, SQL Write, there are also other libraries like Store.io or Requery and so on doing the same thing. But that's very important for me. So again, I would put all those things together. And most of the time, I would say, yeah, SQL Bright or the Eric's Java and the mutability thing is more important to me. Um, but it depends. If I, just, if I am a little startup and I don't have that much time and knowledge, and maybe I should just keep. For a startup, it's important to be early on, on stage, right? So maybe then Realm is the thing for them. So it really depends. But in general, I would prefer the SQL Lite thing. Thanks. OK. You guys, any other questions? If you have a question, please stand up first and then grab the microphone so that we could show you to St. Petersburg that has no questions. <laughs> you can also talk about football or something like that. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, St. Petersburg. <laughs> and <Okay>. go home. <laughs> no, you don't go home. Okay, St. Petersburg. Uh, hello, hello. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, one of the main principles of uh, software development is uh, do not repeat yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as soon as you start doing uh, some. Uh, uh, some type development like MVC or MVP or MVVM or something, you you uh, very soon start to write uh, lots of uh, typical code. You uh, have to repeat those uh, uh, observe and so on, uh, notify property change in uh, .NET and so on. So, uh, how do you uh, fight that uh, repeat uh, that that code uh, re re repeat? Repetition. <laughs> yeah, okay. Do you, do you use uh, some, something like um, aspects or something else? Yeah, what I do, or basically, what are the options? The options are like aspect J or something like that, or inheritance. Those are mainly the two things we have today. But there's another third option, which is composition over inheritance principle. And what we do is um, we, um, well, Actually, we, we, we sit down, or the, we had a problem with our architecture, and we sat down and thought about what are these most expensive things to do? What are these time consuming and yeah, hard things to do, which I don't want to repeat myself? And actually, I think applying a scheduler on Rx Java, it's not a huge deal, it's done in five seconds. Uh, updating some UI things is not a huge deal. But what is a huge deal is writing XML code for adapters and something like that, some layout things. Those are the things that take long. So what we do is us doing some tracking in all your activities without having a giant hierar uh, inheritance hierarchy. So what we do is we, we have some plug-in systems for our adapters, for our uh, activities and fragments, and what we basically say, or basically our fragment, our activity is empty and delegating all the lifecycle events to some plugins. And one of these plugins is the tracking plugin. The tracking plugin does on, on resume, it fires up some analytics tracking thing, 
the adapters are composed also in the same, same way. So we have an adapter where we can plug in some view types with some XML layouts. And presenters, yeah, I mean, that's not a big deal for us. So I think we should really focus on the thing that are um, hard to write. And actually, our presenters are just three, three four lines of code. And the key point is favor composition over inheritance here. And if you are really um, facing problems or time-consuming things like binding stuff to your view, then maybe you should break up your view a little in a little bit in two views so that it's easier to bind things. Or if it's just some repeat, I mean, Button I for some tools like that are doing a great job on that. Eric's Java bindings like view model for automatic updating. So it doesn't have to be MVP you have to use if you are a lazy guy. I am a lazy guy, but I'm not using MVVM, but I'm using more MVP. But if MVVM is working for you just for that reason, that's completely fine. Then you have a good justification to use that thing. And that's all about software architecture. OK, thank you. Now a question from Moscow. Sorry, I can't hear you that good. Please Could you repeat? Yeah, please microphone. Yes. Are you personally going to switch from MVP to MVI? Will it affect Mozilla? Um, to model view intent, you mean, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, well, Mosby is a library I have written, if you haven't heard of it before. It's an MVP library. So. There's also another library in the, in the references doing, written in Kotlin by Christina Lee. Um, it's called, no, it's not, yeah, it's actually by Christina Lee and his coworker Brandon. Or I'm not sure about his name, sorry, Brandon, or whatever your name is. But actually, um, they are, have written a CycleJS clone following this principle strictly. And if you want to use it, I get, I, it looks promising. There are some things which are really, really hard uh, copied from CycleJS, like um, sources and sinks, which I think it's mm, it's it's nice. Okay, you don't have you have pure functions and so on, but it is not that really, really necessary. So that's what I meant before by breaking the rules. So you can't really do it the, the super, super clean way, or you could use Mosby like I do, where I have the mo where I well took from every architecture pattern I have discussed a little bit, a little bit from view, a little bit from presenter, a little bit from intent, a little bit from Redux. But your original uh, question, how does it affect most people? Well, the problem with MVVM and MVI is that they are bound to your view. So screen orientation changes is a little bit problematically. It's not unsolvable, but you may have to use um, uh, behavior or relate to to re uh, in inject the latest state after a screen orientation change or something like that. So there are ways, but I'm not super, super excited about that, but there are ways to do that. But the main problem is once you, you, you change your device and your view is bind to an observable, you have to unsubscribe it, otherwise you would leak memory, right? And in most B, there's a feature called view state, um, which basically was meant to deal with that. So you have a presenter which was um, Surviving screen orientation changes, the view was changed. There was a view state which was applied afterwards, so you don't have to check if bundle is null, then do that, and then reload other data. And if it's not null, do that. So that's basically encapsulated in a single responsible thing called view state. And actually, if you use model view intent, you don't need that view state mm -hmm. anymore. So it doesn't affect most. I don't think that I will implement something model view intent um, in specific. If you want a framework, then this um, cyclic uh, library might be a good start. Or just watch the cycle JS documentation; it's pretty awesome. And by the way, this Andres Tals guy is, is a fantastic speaker, also about JavaScript and a good singer. He has some uh, <laughs> YouTube videos where he plays guitar. Yeah, check them out. Okay, do we get back to St. Petersburg again? Yeah. Screen with multiple view, 
and we should have multiple presenters. How can they uh, communicate with each other? And especially, if I want to use more of those. Okay. So basically, presenters shouldn't communicate with each other. They should be doing. Wait, let me go back. The, basically, the presenter is not a controller. The presenter is. That's also a thing. What is actually a presenter? What is what is it? Is it a life cycle? Has it life cycle events? Um, is he? What is? What's the responsibility of a presenter? The presenter should just give the view, whatever he gets from the model. So the presenter is observing the model, and that's it. And each presenter is a, is just responsible to coordinate his view, giving him this, this the data he gets. So the key feature here is the observer pattern. The presenter should observe the model, and basically something like that here in the screen, if you can see it. So once we update it something. So that's, that's a view, that's a fragment, for instance. In the background, there's another fragment which is displaying the list of items. Then it goes down to the model, and then the model, which is observed by both presenters, will be updated and tell the presenter, hey, I'm updated, I have new data. It's the observer pattern, and then the presenters will update the view. So that's basically how presenters should um, communicate. Now, they don't directly communicate, but they or just observing the same model. And that's not really Mosby related. Um, have I missed something about your question about Mosby? Uh, no, I guess that was your question, right? That's right. Okay. So basically, no presenters shouldn't communicate with each other. Views shouldn't communicate with each other. They just should observe the pattern. Think back to the ori original Wien Scalp thing, something in that direction. And we see Wien's Wien's Kalk thing. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Moscow City. Yes. Please stand up. So, uh, I have a question. First of all, uh, thanks a lot for your coming and for the talk. We really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, my question consists of two parts. The first one is: uh, Have you read a blog post written by Android uh, Framework team lead Dan Hagborn? about how developers uh, should design their applications to uh, deal with the platform, to be consistent with the platform. Have you read it? Yeah. Uh, so the next question is, uh, when would you uh, use a system component uh, to implement some maybe business logic or uh, multi-threading in favor of uh, application component? Um, what do you mean with multi-threading in, in, in favor of composition? In Maybe the concrete example uh, would be uh, when would you use a service, uh, maybe instant service, uh, okay. in favor of uh, just some worker thread? Yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it, okay. So, well, let me stop this first. Thanks uh, for having me, first of all. It's great to be here. Um, regarding your question, Yes, I have read them, and there are reasons why there are services or other components provided by the framework, and that was an, uh, Ms. Hepburn basically describing. What's, what's the thing about service? Services are, have an independent life cycle. So a service doesn't run in the background thread. Or, yeah, an intent service does, but that's the special case. A service is just a flag for the Android operating system to tell, hey, don't kill me. Even if my activity will be killed or destroyed, I have something to do. I, t I will tell you when I'm done. So that's basically a service. So when should I use service? Most of the time, we don't use it for very short things. We use just retrofit for an HTTP request. So here, we don't, we don't really need um, that thing. But for instance, if you do a login, and I have to ensure that it really goes through, then I might would do that with um, a service, especially because I can do some retry things. I also could do that with Eric's Java. Yeah, I could do that, but Eric's Java is still, yeah, kind of bound to the activity usually. Even if the activity um, gets destroyed and I don't unsubscribe, it will continue. But I would say that a service is a good way to do it in that case. So, if I understand you correctly, to ensure data consistency, you would use a system component instead of application one, for example. Yeah, see, the thing is, um, uh, uh, instant, uh, intent service, for instance, which is, uh, I don't have that sample here now, but 
Uh, no, there's, is there internet on that PC? No, there's no mouse. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But for instance, um, in the Plat uh, app, there is there you can post to dribbly some some design stuff. And what I would do here is I would start an intense service uh, and saying and at the same time writing in the database that I have a item that I want to upload. So it is in the database, it is consistent. There's also offline first from uh, talks from Yijit and so on. So offline is really important. So store it in the database and then start the intent service and query for items which are not already updated. But what's the cool thing about that is you have a create or upload post thing, a view, you submit it and now it's in the database. The database is your model. Your model will then um, tell the list of all items that there's a new model, which may I display with a progress indicator, and just showing the user that, hey, you have submitted, but it's not uploaded yet. And again, you have the unidirectional data flow, no presenters communicating with each other. The intent service will be started, querying the database saying, oh, that item must be uploaded. Then I will upload it afterwards. Sure, it may could be work some with some other solutions, like an async task, but services you can mainly reschedule, you could use, oh, actually I would use job scheduler, I guess, or something like that, instead of an intent service lately, but it goes to the, in the same direction, I guess. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we're going back to St. Petersburg, if you're ready. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay, Hannes, please. Okay, so first of all, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> I agree, yeah, it's hard. So the question was uh, about uh, what if we build application of this unidirection data uh, that they flow and um, change our architecture with some good practice, will it uh, keep our code Okay, so the main thing, and that's the reason why I, sh uh, I have this, uh, or had this picture of the cell uh, thing at the very beginning, is that you should define your components as small as possible, and mainly program against interfaces and so on, because then you are free to change some things out whenever needed. So. The body, for instance, takes seven years to replace all your cells in your body. So every seven years you are mainly a new man or a new human. And software architecture should be designed in that way so that you have little cells. And if you have some little cells, it's easier to change things. It's easier to, cha to, r to go from MVC to MM view model, whatever. Um, but if you have spaghetti code, there is one very, very important thing, and that's testing. Because if you have spaghetti code, you will fear that you will break it. And if you don't have tests, you don't know if you will break things. So unfortunately, we haven't covered that. But also the uh, important thing about all these architectures is that they are easy to test. Immutability are easy to test because they can't really change their state. They are not usually not the source of errors. Even if you do multi-threading, and that's very important, um, immutability and multi-threading 
provides from some critical bug with synchronization and so on. Um, yeah, immutability is also. Oh no, let me let me think. Uh, let me start otherwise. Have you ever noticed that, for instance, Eric's Java doesn't have inheritance? That is composition. You never inherit from an observable somehow. You always get or create a new observable, right? And following this pattern will provide you to cleaner code. And if you are in the unlucky situation, every one of us for sure has spaghetti code somewhere. It's very important to have tests. So write the test, make it pass, and then start refactoring. Because that's the only way not to feel making changes. OK, thank you. We have a question from people who watch us on the internet. Yeah. In the what? Yes, there's the <laughs> internet. It's all in Russian, but yeah, half of the words are English, so I will try to translate. <laughs> okay, view state in Mosby looks as a horrible switch case. Are you planning to automate it or at least generate a state code view? Uh, yeah, okay. Does it make sense? Yeah, I guess I know what he's asking about. So, so Moxie, which is another library, I'm, I'm not sure if an author of them are here, but it would be nice to talk to you. Um, does some annotation processing stuff to, to get rid of that thing automatically, but it actually doesn't solve the problem of a huge switch statement or something like that. The most view states I have are basically just two ifs or two states, ma mainly show content, show loading, show error, which is acceptable. If you have more complicated things, then you, most of the time it makes sense. Or it's an indicator that your view is too complex. So if your view are having 500 states, maybe it should be split out into 500 views and then you have only one state per view, right? In theory. Um, Moxie or whatever it is pronounced um, does that annotation processing thing, but here you have to provide some annotation strat strategies on the annotation. So basically, instead of writing if else, if else, or switch, you are placing annotations over there and there and there. So I'm not sh sure it whether it solves the problem. The question is do we need a view state at all? For instance, in Redux, we have a model which is kind of singleton for the whole application. We don't necessarily have to make it passable or something like that. It can be a singleton. It doesn't have a view state. Also, model view intent doesn't have a view state because the idea is you have the latest state, and from the latest state, the view can always render itself. And if you have the latest state, you don't have the view state. Actually, the, the view state itself is a kind of side effect, a bad thing but it is some kind of side effect. But it was the best solution I came across, if you have a better one. But please let me know, I will, uh, I will change that. I'm not saying that view state is a bad thing, but it was the best solution I came in mind to have a presenter being um, surviving screen orientation changes and have also the view some kind of being um, keep in, in, in state, in sync. And the one thing I really hate is when I have a view and sh displaying data and then I switch it to landscape and then I see the loading indicator again. That, that's something I really, really hate. And that was mainly the reason why I introduced that view state thing. And the view state has to be independent from the presenter. Therefore, I came up with that solution. I know it's not super, super perfect. It's a little bit side, side effect uh, likely. Yeah, I have agree. I have no better idea how to implement it, to be honest. And I'm not sure if Moxie do it better. If someone using Moxie, um, please tell me. Yeah, I'm open to change that. Any other questions? OK. okay. Uh, when I use uh, RxJava in my app, uh, like this? Yeah, oh. thanks. Uh, when I use RxJava in my app, it's kind of spreading through the whole app it's used on uh, a lot of different la layers mm -hmm. so if for, fa uh, for some reason uh, somewhere in the future I will decide to get out of uh, Rx it will be very difficult so I, I'm kind of uh, binding my application to this uh, framework uh, yeah. what do you think about that? Well binding yourself to framework is never a good idea you should only do that in the view layer 
Um, but never on the business logic layer side. So you should never have dependency injection stuff passed there. So you should never have. So for instance, in Dagger 1, there was popular to pass around the object graph uh, through some different layers down to the business layer and then inject this to get some other components in. It wasn't really a good idea to do that. It wasn't documented that way, but people, people did that that way, at least in my company, we did it. And it was a bad idea because now we were caught by Dagger and we couldn't get out of there, especially when migrating to Dagger 2. So the thing about Eric's Java, which was your original question, I don't see Eric's Java as a um, framework. I see it as a library. And libraries are completely fine from my point of view. Furthermore, they are the observable is just an interface. So basically, you could implement your own observable, which is just returning not a real Rx Java observable, but doing some other kind of stuff. So I don't think that that will be your m biggest problem. But again, if you have unit tests, you can start refactoring here a little bit. If you have little cells, just remove that old cell, get the new cell in. And the key function here is little cells and programming against interfaces so that you can replace it easily. So, uh, do you use, uh, do you subscribe only on like view model, model for view? Is it? Uh, what do you mean with subscribe only? So, use uh, Eric's Java only in with view model? I, I have a like model layer in application mm -hmm. where I store, for example, uh, tweets for like Twitter app. Mm -hmm. And uh, I subscribe for it. In uh, your view? Uh, from, uh, from my view layer to show the tweets. Yeah. But it's, it's uh, I subscribe for it from the model. A model is not view layer. Uh, so you are applying this, uh, you are subscribing from the model. And, but how, d how does it get updated to the view? Subscribing from the view to the model. Yeah, 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 model okay. Model is not a view layer, and you say it uh, use Rx on, on like you. Yeah, now I get it. Okay. Yeah, um, what I do, I I use model view presenter, and I subscribe on the presenter layer. Um, the reason why I do that is that I want to have my because if I would do that in the view layer, then the I have to unsubscribe on every screen orientation change, which is yeah not the best solution for hand well. It's the only solution not to leak memory, but not the best solution to keep in touch. But it really depends if you're, for instance, if you have only a database where your database will, um, okay, then you require the database after a screen orientation change, then it may not be a big deal. But I would like to have the presenter and the model keep alive as long as possible. And so screen orientation changes shouldn't uh, affect that. So I, I don't see any problem by doing that, to be honest. So if you do it in the view layer, just do it. Um, I don't think that it's a problem from my point of view. But yeah. as your ne next question, if you want to read it, you want to read it. Out loud? <laughs> you want me to do it? Do, yeah, please. Okay. <coughs> do you prefer to divide business logic and view code, even in the simplest cases, like just showing info from Pojo with zero possible users interactions, or do you think that if a case is very simple, business logic and View code can be mixed. Uh, what was the last part with mixed? Would you like to look at it? Because it's a translation. Ah, so. Uh, <laughs> Great. Um, Are you hungry? Because there's food. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to. So the question is should I over architect my business logic? No. In any, any way, don't do it. That's what leads to more problems. One, one thing, for instance, I see quite a lot is when I see people applying um, the clean architecture is that they introduce a class use case and they extend from this use case for every use case. But why do you limit yourself to that class? Now this use case had on, has only an execute method, for instance, which takes zero parameter. But what if you have some kind of login where you pass some username and password in and then hand, have it to handle to the use case? So do you create a use case and pass it as constructor every time? But most of the time you want to inject the use case somehow. So um, the thing is, don't over-architect things. Keep it simple as possible. Don't introduce layers unless you need it. That's generally my advice. And if you have mixed up view code with in your business logic, well, then we have, sp have spaghetti code. By the way, you also can write Eric's Java spaghetti code. So um, 
that's the thing you should refactor basically. And again, unit testing is the key. Write an expressor test with just some mock thing and yeah. Now we have a question from St. Petersburg and then the question from Oscar. Yeah, great. The voice uh -huh. for your speech. Uh, it was rather interesting. Uh, you mentioned two times about testing, so I assume you practice uh, testing development uh, widely. Uh, just uh, interesting in your experience, could you share uh, briefly what kind of tests uh, do you write and practice for mobile development and uh, particularly uh, about uh, UI tests? Uh, how much cases uh, should be covered and what cases and uh, has it uh, sense at all to write UI tests in mobile development? Thanks. Oh, great question. So I tried to keep it short because I think I could speak there for hours about that. So I don't do UI tests a lot. Um, that's the short answer. The long answer is I do presenter um, and business logic tests uh, a lot. The reason why I don't do UI tests is that basically my UI are pretty, pretty stupid, simple. They can't basically nothing go wrong. That doesn't mean that uh, is everything okay, but I mean, what's, what's the thing testing clicking on a button? Sure, you can do that, but if you just pre test the present the downwards, then it's from my point of view enough, and I would write UI tests if it don't take that long to execute them. Then I may write UI tests. So it doesn't hurt to start from the UI layer testing downwards. But as long as the situation is as it is, I don't think that I'll write UI tests. But what I do is, I don't write espresso tests, but what I do is I write um, graphical, uh, what is it called exactly in, in English? I, I write uh, tests that show me some uh, graphical regression. So basically, what I find more annoying is having a, a button not displayed the way it is, or a text view the way it should be. And that's not testable with Espresso. But there's a nice tool by Facebook. Um, I, will, I can't remember the name. Um, but what it does is it takes a screenshot of your view, of your XML layout. It, basically, we do that with, with um, our adapters, um, XML adapters, uh, XML layout for our adapters. We take a screenshot, fill them with some data. Then we can say, it, OK, layout that with that width and that width. Then it takes a screenshot. We do that on, the, on our CI, then the next days or whenever we build it, we take an, again the screenshot and this cool thing by Facebook will then compare these two screenshots and will fail the build if they are different. So basically what we are doing is a graphical UI regression testing instead of UI function testing because I think that's more valuable. Thank you for your talk. Um, so, first question is about the Hackburn post, which you discussed, and it's great. It basically said that you know, create Android apps as simple Java main, static void main programs, and so on. But the thing is different with Android is state restoration, and the process die, and the process can then restore its state and do you feel like it should be part of some design pattern like MVVM or MVP or something? Or it should be just part of concrete library like Mosby? And maybe we should invent something more universal that no matter what pattern you use, you can restore your state? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think the best you can do is design for offline first. So having a database stored uh, things in is, is a great way to avoid that kind of things. What I did in Mosby is Mosby has this thing view state, <laughs> and what it does is it has two variants of view state. The one view state is simply a view state that will be kept in memory just for screen orientation changes because most of the time that is simply enough because you just want to have screen orientation changes. But if you make this view state actually parsable, which means you would also make your model parsable, then it will also survive screen orientation change, uh, process kills because it will be restored afterwards from the, from the bundle. But the thing I have faced quite often is that in the meantime, the data that will be restored um, is outdated. 
So I think screen orientation changes handling in some view state or some kind of stuff is, is pretty cool. Storing that model persistent, I'm not sure if this is the super way for everything to go. I would rather say if that occurs, let the whole thing reload to get the freshest data. And actually, this is one of my concerns when writing um, most be free, because there I have some changes to, or have planned to add some changes um, for better backstack um, um, integration for um, flow from Square. And there's also that kind of philosophical question: What should happen if the if the if I put something on the view on the on the backstack? A presenter on the no, I'm not putting a presenter on the backstack, but I'm removing a view from the backstack, so a, a new view will be pushed on the on the stack, and the view will be disappear. Should now the presenter be alive? But if it's alive, to get this uh, unidirectional data flow, it can't update the view because the view isn't there because it has been destroyed because it's on the backstack somehow. Um, here again, I could serialize it again, but then if I come back to the Backstack to that position on the backstack by pressing the back button, that data might be outdated, and that's the problem. And here I'm, I'm not sure which, in which direction you go, and I would love to hear your feedback maybe afterwards if you have some, some similar uh, problems or face some similar problems, because I'm actually not sure how to implement it. It's not a matter how to implement it, but what's the best way to implement it, or should I implement it at all? But in general, I think process die occur not that often, and if they occur, it's better to refresh, refresh everything. But if you could build offline first apps with some database and so on, it would be really, really uh, a better user experience than instead of showing that loading spinner again. Not sure if it should be part of model view intent at all. I said it is part of Mosby, but I rarely do it in Mosby view state with the possible thing because of that reason that it is outdated and display old data. And yeah. Yeah. So now about testing. Um, you said that you're not writing UI tests. Not that many. No. So it looks like you write only tests for presenters. Yeah, most of the time. Now I'm going to ask you, did you see a picture where you know two windows are near close to each other? And the unit test is to open the window, right? And the window works. You can open the window. But yeah. when you try to open both of them at the same time, they will stack and block each other. So without UI tests or integration tests between presenters and without trying to recreate the flow, the unidirectional flow the, that actually happens in your app, in your tests, you're probably producing a lot of possible bugs. Yeah. So what about this? That's definitely definitely true, and I wouldn't be a good speaker if I would uh, recommend you to not write such tests. That's you are, you are completely right, but I do take that risk. YOLO. <laughs> 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 yeah, basically because the most of my views are just loading some data from from an HTTP uh, over an HTTP request, displaying it. So there's not a button. There's not much it can that can go wrong. Sure, I don't test if the view is connected to presenter correctly and so on. So you are completely right. That should be tested and is not under the test coverage report, but I don't care. <laughs> Any other questions? But don't don't try this at home. <laughs> I always wanted okay. to say that. We have five minutes to go. Oh okay. We'll that way. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to ask some uh, maybe slightly off topic question, uh, but what your thoughts about, uh, I'd say, uh, the future of Android languages? So we speak about Kotlin, Java 8, Jack and Jill, uh, compiler framework, and so on. So do you have any thoughts about this? Will it solve, uh, for example, uh, build time compilation problem? Yeah. And uh, maybe what do you think about Swift? Yeah. Well, actually, I, I do some Swift programming as well from time to time, especially when the iOS team has some uh, deadlines to meet. And the language per, per se isn't that bad. It's, it's similar to Kotlin. I don't think that we will ever s see in the near future um, Swift replacing Java, but maybe as an alternative to C or C++ in the GNI um, 
well, yeah, that would be that would be an option. The build time, uh, it's incredible slow. I I also do from time to time backend development, and uh, it's it's uncomparable, especially when doing test driven development. I know that they, they they do a lot. They try a lot of things. They they try instant run. They get better. I know they are working really really hard on that, but it's still unacceptable from my point of view. And yeah, by the way, Jack and I hope that Jack and Jill will solve that one day. But honestly, uh, Oracle or the other compiler uh, programmers spent years in optimizing that things, and they are already at the very beginning of Jack and Jill. I don't expect to achieve that performance in the near future. But yeah. Yeah. So have you tried incremental compilation and so on? Does it help in your case? Well, instant run doesn't work well for me. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure how the Android team does that, but I'm pretty sure that the Android team um, are not building such big apps that we do, but I see myself cleaning out the, the, the project uh, quite a lot to make that thing running. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Thank you for your talk, and I have my question about Google I.O., what was the most interesting thing for you uh, that they introduced? Well, I, first of all, uh, I, I haven't attended the I.O. personally because I'm not a GDG or whatever it takes to go there. And, uh, well, from a, from a developer point of view, I was excited about the constraint layout thing. I think it's, it's nice. I haven't played too much with it, but looks promising. From a customer point of view, I like the Google Home thing. I'm not sure um, if I would ever use it, but it looks interesting. And it scares me also a little bit, but it might be interesting. But uh, it would be great to have an API or something like that, but I guess it's the risk of getting hacked or something like that over an API is too big at the moment, at least. But that would be great. Um, the quality of the speaks about development in general was pretty pretty surprisingly good. Um, the fragment, what the fragment talk was interesting, I guess, and maybe if we if someone will talk about fragments later on, I'm I'm open to do that. Firebase. Oh, Firebase, yeah. Mm. <laughs> I don't know why Google always does this rename thing and merge things and Firebase. I'm not sure. Why not let it as Google Play Services as it is? I mean, it, it works great. It, I do understand that Firebase can be useful for, for developers that are n don't have a backend, but why not letting it as the way it is right now? And Well, I'm pretty sure Google will have good reasons to do that, but I'm not the biggest fan of Firebase. But we also have to say that there are a lot of other people not experienced like we are, which are getting the feeds well with mobile development in emerging markets like India and whatever, and for them, having a solution that just works magically would be, would be great, right? And for us, well, we don't have to hopefully have to use it, but it seems that GCM or Google Play services will like merge with Firebase. I'm not super excited about, but as long as it works somehow I, without bugs, I'm, I'm, I don't care. You know, there's an explanation for anything that goes wrong in a company, marketing. Uh. <laughs> so if you want to talk about Google I.O., you can talk to Ildar, because he went. Oh, yeah. And he got sunburned and brainwashed. And so came back without gadgets. About well, <laughs> let's wrap up with a philosophical question, and then we'll go eat. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of a generic question. Uh, what do you consider a biggest problem and obstacle for Android developers in general? Or if you're, for instance, were on framework um, planning team, what would you fix or implement first? That's a good question. <laughs> well, actually, the most of, uh, of developers I know would say fragments. I personally don't have a problem with fragments. I use them quite often. The problem with fragments is that they have so many lifecycle callbacks, that's true. But I guess I found a way how to deal with that lifecycle so that it works. So for instance, I don't 
do things in unattached. I don't think do things in on activity created and so on. I just do it in that specific callback, and I think that it's the right callback. Um, otherwise, I think there were great, great. One of the things that I have missed the last year was, was some UI things, related things, and with the design support library, we were a good step forward there with some good UI things and seeing the constant layout coming, coming in. What I would like to have is um, something like code generation for XML infl inflation. So instead of inflating some binary XML, which requires some reflection, it would be great if that could be a Gradle plugin generate for you. So we see quite a lot of lags when scrolling our long recycler list view because the recycler view will inflate new items. I know you can configure the pool to don't do that, but it's a little bit tricky and it's, our app is very huge, I have to admit that. So it's not something you might run into. But there I really see a, a lot of yeah, 12 to 16 milliseconds just inflation time. And I think this is our fault because our layouts are not that clean and flat, but if there were no reflection, it may be a little bit better. Just wanted to add about that. One guy built a Gradle plugin that generates a code from your layout, and this code basically does exactly the same thing that layout does. Oh, that's great. Yeah, just, just try it. It yeah. only has problems with custom, uh, you know, uh, what is what is name, namespaces and attributes, mm -hmm. but they have some plans how to solve it. And it looks like it really will solve, you know, this 12 to 16 milliseconds problem because it doesn't use reflection at all. Yeah, that's okay. great. Especially when using now the constant layout and get faster there when layouting. But what we really see is when flinging or something like that, we have that inflation time coming in and that, yeah, the scroll performance on not high end device is not that great there. Yeah, but. I would love to hear your opinion on such philosophical things right after, right? So, uh, yes. I guess well, if there are no more questions. Let's say thank you to Hannes, because it's just impossible to answer all the questions in public. Yeah. So now, informally, you may ask all your, all your thousand questions. If you need a translator, <laughs> use, the, use the guys that ask the questions. So, Hannes. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was really good. <laughs>